Testing. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Could I politely ask that all phones are turned off? <laughs> First of all. So have a look at your phones. Let's see what's going on. If they're on, turn them on silent or off or on vibrate. Oh, if you want to tweet, that's fine. Silent, silent, <laughs> silent. Right. Okay, we're starting five minutes early. So hopefully we get you out early as well, all of you. Right. Thank you all so much for coming. This is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome to the AI Talks. My name is Leanne Page. I'm the co-founder of the AI Talks, and I'm also program director for Wonderman at WPP. This is the fourth edition of the AI Talks, when we're going to do a little bit of deep dive on AI and creativity, and what that really means to all of us and our panel. This is very much a open dialogue between the panel and you guys. So what we try to do in our discussions is really have this open and it's about you guys, not only me asking the questions, but you too. So really this is a time and the space to ask the, the types of questions that you like to ask the panel so that we can move the conversation on and forward. So to start off, creativity could be described as a form of human expression that communicates emotionally and in intellectually and individual thoughts and feelings concerning themes about self, dreams and visions, issues and relationships. All people are therefore creative. There is a strong belief that creativity is about humanity. Shortly, as I said earlier, I'll be asking you about your definition of creativity because all our perspectives are very, very different when it comes to this conversation, not only the conversation, but in life and how we see the world. So based on our own perspectives, we allow ourselves the opportunity to define what's good and what's not so good. Either as a consensus, as a group such as this one, or whether it's with people that we trust, whether it's friends or family, or whether it's in the privacy of our own thoughts, we do get into this judgment space. Oh, that's not good, that's great, that's hot, that's not. I like that, I don't like that, for whatever reason. So what was interesting is for us, as we have run these events over the last year, um, the common discussion that kept coming up, whether we were talking about ethics or social media or any other subjects, the, the, the discussion around creativity always came up in our discussions with the audience and you, the people. And this is what drove us to this point, really, is to have this discussion. I believe we've become the world's critic. Data is now the new gold. And we have somehow found a new way of organizing science and data through open dialogues between scientists, the arts, and technologists. But outside looking in, what does that really look like? How do we view this from our perspective? I think in recent years, the way that we thrive in our environments is becoming more and more important for us, with or without AI given everything that's going on in the world. We all want to do the best that we can do in our everyday life and what that looks like and when new, techno new technologies come in, um, how that then impacts our everyday. So this session really is to really give us the opportunity to explore all those avenues. So please have a think while I introduce you to the panel of what your definition of creativity is, because I'll be asking a few of you of what that looks like for you. So if we give a huge round of applause to our panel who will join us now. So clappy, clappy, we come over. Whoa. <laughs> no. 
So if you'd like to introduce yourselves, um, your name, what you do, and also I love to hear, I think we'll all love to hear, what your definition of creativity is first, and then we can take it from there. I didn't know I was going to speak first when I started my <laughs> first. Okay, here we go. Uh, hello, my name is Lachlan. Uh, I am the head of strategy at RGA London. Uh, creativity, uh, I suspect <laughs> we're going to have a lot of different definitions here, but I'm going to go super broad on mine and say that it is uh, imagination and original thinking and just kind of leave it as abstract and as broad as that. Hi, I'm Stelios. Um, I'm a data scientist. So I'm going to be offering more of a technologist view of the subject. Uh, I run my own executive education company, the TESSERT Academy. And I'm also uh, running my own consultancy in data science and blockchain. And uh, I'm also affiliated with University College London as a member of the Blockchain Center. And talking about uh, my definition of creativity, I guess everyone in this room has a different definition. Uh, mine would be that creativity is about making something that's more than just the sum of its parts. Yeah, so for whatever it's worth, this is my definition. Hi, sorry about the entrance with the water. Um, anyway, hi, my name is Pip Jameson. I am the founder and CEO of The Dots. Um, quick question, who in here has heard of The Dots? Okay, magic. Ah, oh, people are real. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, I guess Forbes called us the next LinkedIn. Why? Because we look after a community that we like to call no-collar professionals. That's creators, freelancers, and entrepreneurs. Um, I guess being intrinsically linked to the creative industries, I think what I find really fascinating is how um, people don't really see outside of the creative industries that they're creative, but I think your definition that it's a human trait was one of the best I've heard. Um, you know, in essence, we're all creative. It's one of the things that makes us human. And I think Steve Jobs put it very well as well. He said, you know, creativity is about connecting things and the experiences that we have as humans and coming up with creative solutions and ideas around those those sort of experiences that we have. And that would be my very broad definition. We're all creative and it's human. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kostov Bhattacharya. I'm the exec director for technology at RGA. Um, so I had like 5,000 different definitions of creativity, <laughs> but I had to stick to one. Um, and for me, um, as a technologist, it's about problem solving. And in my industry, you know, we have creatives and technologists and that sort of in-between profession, which is the creative technologist. And actually, I think all technologists are creative technologists because we have to find creative ways to solve the problems that we're trying to solve, build the things that we're trying to build. Um, and so for me, that's what creates one of the 20,000 things that creativity <laughs> stands for. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gauthier. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Obvious, which is a, an art collective. Uh, and basically, we create uh, artworks with uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithms called uh, GANs. And um, my definition of creativity would be uh, uh, it would be like it's about like creating something that is uh, outside the box but still relates to the box. So yeah, that'd be the the idea. Thank you. Just to cir circle back because I'm gonna come to you in a minute. So hopefully you've got some definitions of creativity on your side in a second. But just to kind of encapsulate more of the human side, because we're going to hear all different perspectives. So I think over the last year, again, where I alluded to a lot of the discussion that had come up, there was a consensus that what makes us human are these elements. So obviously creativity, common sense, empathy, intuition, consciousness, the power to choose, so choice, emotion, and there's an argument that compassion for others is really what makes us human as well, and how we then relate that back to AI and so on and so forth. So within that context, everything that you've just heard, all the different perspectives, um, I'd love to hear from some of you what your perspective of creativity is, and then we can get stuck into some of the questions. Who wants to go? Yeah? Um, here is oh, we have a catch box. Fine. Did he get a microphone? You've got one? Oh, I do. I Go, have on. One. Yeah. Go on, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We can improvise, it's fine. Go it's on. a simple one. So uh, very much like Kostov, uh, creativity is about problem solving, but in a way that it becomes common sense after you solve the problem. 
Okay, any more? Okay, one down here. Okay. You get the camera. Brilliant. Oh, wow. This is really square. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> morals, constraints, rules by which we are constrained during our creative period. Because we can think of all sorts of things and all sorts of people create all sorts of things with different moral sets. And so I wonder if we need to have some little constraints like whoever we're creating shouldn't kill anybody, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. Any more? We'll take a couple more. Let's throw it to the next person you can see with a hand up. <laughs> Thanks. The ability to produce something unexpected, surprising, okay. but pleasantly surprising. Okay, great. We'll take one more if there is one more. If not, we can dive into the questions. Yeah. Uh, expression of your own perspective. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, we'll leave it there. We'll get stuck into the questions. So, whoa. I love the catch box. <laughs> Great. So thank you for your perspectives. And I think um, as the discussion goes on, it's going to unearth a lot of this, I think. Um, I think there's a spectrum between the anti versus the for when it comes to this and everything in between. So we're going to see if we can address some of those things. If not, we'll carry on. So first question. So. To all of you, really, because I'd love to hear from all of you on this one, how is AI impacting your world and your industry right now? What's happening right now? Here we go. Uh, yeah. So if we start with the yeah, if we start with the art, uh, the art world, which is the one uh, I work in, um, basically it's like uh, it's like uh, a few hundred years ago uh, with photography. So a lot of people say. Uh, what artificial intelligence creates is a bit uh, blurry. Is a bit. Uh, it's for a qualified engineer, uh, so it's not really accessible. Uh, but we'll get there. Uh, there will be like some softwares uh, developed for that, uh, and so I think it will result like photography in the the creation of a new branch in art and a, a new way to create with new tools. Um. I, th I think there's some really fascinating stuff now emerging. Um, uh, we were just talking about it before uh, the start of this evening around um, uh, something called generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, which is, I believe, something that you use in, in your work. And when when we look at some of the things that are coming out in the area of uh, deep fakes uh, that have got a lot of uh, attention, sometimes bad, sometimes interesting in the news recently, you know, they're taking advantage of this the same technology that you're using. And I think in, in, uh, in RGA's industry of marketing and advertising, being able to harness that power for good, I think is a really, really powerful um, uh, way of uh, extending the message of brands into er areas, of, uh, areas such as uh, corporate social responsibility and being able to use celebrity uh, voices um, uh, depending on if you know what a, a deep fake is, but you know, being able to uh, emulate or fake somebody uh, with their permission to uh, to uh, project uh, a message of positivity, uh, for example, around sustainability, around climate change in the world, um, and the other area I think is around personalization. Uh, for me, uh, in the advertising marketing industry, it's huge. Um, I, I mean, I could go on about it for hours, but just one example is being able to uh, not only target people for content that they prefer, but um, actually realizing beyond simplistic targeting and simplistic models, how people's preferences change over time and being able to adapt to that dynamically. Amazing answer, how the fuck do I follow that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess um, I'm gonna talk more macro, I guess, um, you know, we look after the creative industries, I think, a lot of time people think creative industries is quite small, just to put it into context, uh, about 9% of the uh, GDP is derived from the creative industries, about 10% of the workforce work in the creative industries. I think, you know, AI has definitely changed different perspectives of industry. So for example, with the creative industries that has outpaced the growth of all other industries since about twice the rate since 2011, but there's different industries that have been disrupted or affected in different ways by AI. Um, I think advertising is really 
interesting one. I think RGA is sort of on the forefront of it, but the more traditional agencies are kind of fucked, right? <laughs> Sorry, that's an, I'm going to swear a lot. This is really bad. <laughs> um, um, but I think, yeah, it is down to, I mean, if you look at uh, media spend now, you know, 25% of media spend or media revenue goes to Google and Facebook. If you look back in 2011, that was only 9%. That is because of the personalization that they've been able to do. So things within industries are being disrupted. You look at music and Spotify and the personalization they've been able to do. So it's it's aggregately improved the industry, but on different levels, there's a lot of layers of disruption happening at the same time for the people that aren't keeping pace with the, the innovation that's happening. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I'm a data scientist, so it's not like, AI is disrupting my industry. <laughs> it's like I'm more like part of this industry. Uh, but what I've observed is that um, AI and data science expand across more and more industries. Uh, so it's, it's not just about uh, these technologies creating value. It's also about people becoming believers in some cases of this greater vision of, uh, of automation. So what we're going to observe over the next 10 to 20 years is automation, automation of many tasks, which which traditionally being done by humans. And something which many of you might not be aware is that not even a data scientist's job is safe because now one of the ne next frontiers in AI is actual, it's what we call meta learning, basically AI for AI. So data science, uh, even though it has this science word in there, it's more of a craft these days rather than science. Yeah, so it's still in the stage where you have to experiment a lot. You need experience to figure out what you're doing and what not. I would say there's a certain element of creativity involved. And there are people who are now trying to automate this. Uh, so in 10 years, maybe even data science will not be immune to this automation threat brought by AI. And now I'm at the end of the food chain of answering these questions. Um, uh, I guess from my perspective, working in a, a creative industry, I see AI as a tool. Uh, and it kind of, I mean, the, the point around photography is a really interesting one because it, it, if you define AI in its kind of the traditional sort of logic-based form, it's been around for a while and it has massively influenced the categories that, or industries and experiences that you kind of realize are just kind of normal. Um, but for us, we kind of, I mean, so, so if creativity is the thing that uh, is, this, is the substance and the currency of, of the, the work that our agency does um, in many different forms, um, and I, I, I kind of think about creativity as, as, the, as a way that you collect the different experiences and kind of uh, knowledge and skills that you have applied to something and generate something ideally new and positive and, uh, and kind of constructive. Um, so if AI is a tool through which you can actually increase the number of signals and experiences that you can possibly combine together, then that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, it's also quite clearly a tool that we're using um, for many of our, of our clients and partners as a way to accelerate kind of value for, for, for their businesses and to change the types of experiences you know, through personalization and, and other things. So at the moment, I think AI for us is, a, is, is very much a tool. Um, there will be a long discussion, I suspect, in a, approximately 10 minutes. Um, about the kind of the ethics and, and morals of kind of where the technology ultimately goes when we do have this kind of level of kind of meta learning, um, when it starts to develop its own thought processes um, that isn't guided almost entirely by kind of the, the human constraints that we currently give it. Thank you very much. And I would like to pick up your point around the use of tool because um, th once upon a time, there was a time when we were not using um, AI such things and now we have so I'm really interested to hear about the transition between when it wasn't there and where it is now and how it's uh, changed the process for you guys in terms of creating things and the level of engagement that you end up having as, as a human and as you work with the tool itself so I'm intrigued about what does now the process look like and in what ways has that changed Let's start. yes please yes Let's start. <laughs> Um, for me, it actually means I spend more time with other people. To, to be, I mean, this, that's just my, my personal preference and how I, I ultimately use it. I use it as a way to accelerate knowledge in certain areas. I use it a, as a way to kind of automate things that I would have previously spent quite a lot of time doing so that I have more space, both you know, time-wise and, and also um, emotionally and intellectually. 
so that I can spend more time with other people doing the the kind of the pure kind of human creative task. Um, it gets more complicated than this, kind of ultimately and and eventually. Um, but for the most part, my my use case of it at least is is to kind of spend a bit more time uh, doing the human work. Any other comments on that? If not, but yeah. Yeah, I think riffing off what Lachlan was saying, I think um, uh, many forms of machine learning uh, in its various different guises um, is bringing more efficiency and time saving to us. So you know, two great examples I've seen recently is um, he's not 19 anymore, but when he created um, Do Not Pay um, about three years ago, uh, the guy who got 30 parking tickets in the space of 12 months and figured out there's got to be a way of contesting these in a, an efficient way. Um, and he created a decision tree based um, bot that you could go to as a member of the public who's just got a parking ticket and contest it in a far more efficient way than going through the rigmarole of the usual process. And I think in the, in the, in the space of a year, he saved people $2.5 million or something like that through the system. So that wasn't groundbreaking AI, you know, it was just simple decision trees, uh, logic based reasoning. Um, but you know, then there's other systems like natural language processing systems that can help lawyers, for example, sift through the heavy duty sort of menial donkey work of uh, reading through a contract and putting red lines in them. But why, why does a person have to do that anymore? Why can't they figure on the, why can't they focus on the more uh, creative and more productive side of uh, legal law rather than just doing the repetitive stuff that can be easily or relatively easily automated now? There are solutions out there that do that. Great, thank you. Any other comments on that? No? Okay, next question for you then. So, um, so based on that, um, and I'm going to touch on the word invention when it comes to creativity, because it's all about come up, coming up with something new. And I think in the space of AI right now, um, based on what you've seen and heard and researched and studied and everything, do you think AI could get to a place where it can tru truly invent something new? I mean, this is a big question because as a human being, do we actually truly invent something new in itself? But given what we know and how our brains work and so on and so forth, do you think AI could should get there, do that? Mind if I go again? Go! <laughs> um, I think to... Yeah. So I think so I think in invention in a way if you've invented something you need to be able to explain that you've invented it and why it's a genuinely new invention. Um and from my from my knowledge and own research I don't think yet that artificial intelligence broadly has got to a point where it can explain itself depending on which uh popular news outlets or more specialist news outlets you read. You, you would have probably heard about how um, the, the problem around how neural networks can't yet explain how they've come to a conclusion uh, in a tangible and repeatable way. There's a lot of work in that area happening to solve that problem. But the fundamental question here is, is if you can't explain how you've come up with something, be it an invention or what, whatever, how can you substantiate that invention in the first place? <laughs> well, that's a good point. But then again, for example, if we talk about creativity or works of art, uh, then you, you don't always expect someone to completely explain how they came up with the idea. And even with uh, science um, or mathematics sometimes, uh, there's this art element where someone might come up with an idea, but they can't really explain how they came up with the idea at that point in time even though in retrospect, it might seem as if everything makes sense. Uh, and I think we see this with research all the time. So talking about, for example, AI inventing something, uh, in terms of the arts, we've seen some impressive results, AI generating music, um, generative adversarial networks, generating uh, images, which are you know, quite novel in quite a few, uh, in many aspects. Uh, talking about more technical inventions, um, we've seen optimization algorithms such as genetic algorithms being used in order to come up with new designs in terms of architecture or industrial designs for objects. Um, so there is something there. Probably not in the sense that maybe some 
you know, people who are in love with science fiction would imagine, you know, for robots, you know, dreaming and coming up with new ideas. Uh, but, but I'd say I'm more of an optimist, uh, if, if that's an optimistic position around AI, that yes, there is something there around AI and creativity and inventions. I love that you're using the art example because funny enough, when I was making notes for this session, I was talking about, you know, the artist who sold, you know, their artwork to Christie's for 400,000 and he's here. <laughs> um, so I had this actual debate with someone on stage recently where they said creativity is dead because AI is doing paintings and they're selling for 400,000. But the reality is it was still a human that created that painting and he's sitting on this panel. Um, so I think, will it ever happen? I mean, God, you know, no one wants to be a futurist, but it won't happen quickly. I think right now we're in a phase of, you know, it can augment our creativity. Yeah. And will we get to a phase where we have built better versions of ourselves? Maybe quantum robotics is a very long way off. Um, God help us all at that point, but it's not going to happen really quickly. Right now, we should see it as a tool, yeah. as long as we um, put that tool to a positive end, I yeah. think is the most important thing. Great. Thank you. I mean, it's a nice segue to uh, Gautier. So, because your the story is amazing, right? Uh, yeah, it is quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite uh, out of nowhere, but uh, yeah, yeah. It, was, uh, it was quite a story. So... Yeah, basically, we created a series of uh, of, portrait, of portraits, and we trained uh, GAN algorithms, uh, so artificial uh, intelligence algorithms, to create a new picture based on a large number of examples. So we took like uh, fifteen thousand portraits, and basically the the algorithm recognizes the colors, the traits, and learns how to make a new example a new example of that. So um, I wouldn't say that it's uh, totally creative, but I can definitely say that it's inventive because it created something. That is really new, and also, um, I would say like one interesting point. Maybe you can you can correct me because you're the, the data scientist, so and I'm not. <laughs> um, but uh, we we don't totally understand how GAN works. So basically, uh, we we train it, but we we can also follow every every step of the training and see how it evolves. But uh, we don't really know uh, why it created uh, what it created. So that's maybe a feature of creativity that we that we can look at like something that we we can't really seize and maybe that's uh that's what creative creativity is and maybe when the algorithm can explain what it did uh, we will have a better idea do you think it would produce the same work if you did it again no it, it, it won't again. and yeah. that's part of the yeah. of the of the whole process if you train it again on the same data it will create something totally different right. That's awesome. <laughs> Great. I would like to stay with you for a second because I think it, it brings up another question around value. And because you've had that huge sale, I would love to hear more on... <laughs> you said, what did you spend so it on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have the money on my account. <laughs> <right> now, <so. laughs> but I'm thinking about a lot, yeah. of, the, yeah, but, a lot of ways. Yeah, but, but more, on the, more on the edge of what, what things did you and your team have to consider in order to get the value? To value the artwork? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so at first we valued it at uh, $10,000, uh, but it was, um, so there's part of, uh, you have to consider like the production cost. Uh, it costs a lot of uh, computing power to create uh, such an artwork. So that's part of the, of the price. Uh, then the time to make it, uh, you have to, we have to pay the rent. So that's also part of the price. Um, and, but more more than that, it's more like uh, you can consider as it as a like as a normal product. You are, you you have like the production costs, and you also have like offer and demand. And there are like uh, a few artists doing that uh, in the market, and uh, so a few artworks are available, and that's what uh, makes the price. But honestly, uh, we just decided to to hit like a kind of premium art, so that's why we chose a price that is quite uh, quite high. Okay, so back to the um, earlier point around. Um, as humans, what we consider is something that's good and not good, for instance. As in, we appreciate a piece of art. Some of us could look at the piece of art that was created by AI and go, well, I don't like that because it's created by AI just because it was created by AI, right? Um, or it could go the other way. So I'm intrigued of, in a way, from a human level, the buyer, why did he buy, he or she buy that piece 
was it because it was created by AI, or is there is is there another level to to that from your perspective? Uh, so, yeah. So uh, first, it, wa it wasn't created by AI. It was created with AI. Okay. So we we used it like as a tool, and we we like we choose the data. We have in mind what will happen uh, with it. So that's like a, an important distinction to make. Like it's not uh, autonomous, and you have to 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 follow it like all the steps uh, of the way. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm coming from the perspective of the buyer now. Yeah, why why did he yeah. why did he buy it? Okay. Yes. So I think uh two reasons. First, uh he was kind of buying like a, a moment of history because it was one of the first artwork to be sold uh in a main auction house uh, uh so which was a uh, Christie's. So that's that's what uh I think the the main motivation behind it. Um and we it was probably because it was uh, it was created by AI um, because I think it brings like a new uh, perspective to art because uh, it was created with AI so we don't really know uh, why it was created so uh, your in interpretation of the artwork is as good as mine so and probably that's uh, this new per perspective is a uh, kind of uh, appealing. Yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Has anybody got any more to add? Yep, go for it. I think the biggest question mark in my mind is if if an AI is going to be inventing something, it's probably today going to be inventing it on the basis of our current human biases. So on that then, <laughs> because we all, we all have our own sets of ideals, ideas um, based on our background, culture, so on and so forth, and it's all going to look very very different everyone i mean there's so many ends of the debate on this one because there is on one hand okay how can we regulate better in the future so that we can catch these things so we can make sure it's all diverse all encompassing of what who humans are and it catches everything but the reality is what i'm seeing more and more is actually there is a subset of people who are in these circles so therefore the output will only be what we put in, exactly what you said, what we put in is what we get out, right? So on that note then, <laughs> uh, what other ways, what other things could we be doing to make sure that we have a more of a broader church when actually putting the data in so we can get what we need out of it? So go for it. Uh, no? I mean, I think most importantly, we've got to start focusing on having teams that are building things that reflect society as a whole. I think right now t too many things are being built by very homogenous team. A any woman in the audience get really pissed off with Alexa because she doesn't listen to you? No? Okay, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, a complete running joke with me and my husband, but she will listen to my husband, but she will not listen to me. And this isn't just oh, wow. coincidence. <laughs> this is because, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you're, so she listens to you and not your wife? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, this is a proven fact. She listens to men more than she listens to women. Again, this is because we have taught Alexa with primarily homogenous teams. In the end, we all have biases. It's human nature to have biases. Um, you know, let's kind of look back in time when we were building things, a really kind of, I guess, life and death example is when seatbelts were invented, they were invented by a homogenous team. And um, what was happening is that women were less likely to have accidents, but were 43% more likely to die in those accidents because they were built by a homogenous team that didn't test it on female test crash dummies or didn't think about female anatomy. And if you're thinking about that in terms of building a seatbelt, if you start doing that on a mass level where we're teaching machines to learn, but those machines are being taught by primarily homogenous teams, we're just escalating things on a mass level. So I think mostly it's really important that we start really focusing on building teams that reflect society. Um, so that was my first benchmark. Great, thank you. Any other comments? So yeah, what I, uh, I'd like to say is that uh, I think the issue of bias in machine learning algorithms is so important right now that I think it has its own niche of researchers. Um, I guess many of you might have heard of this story about um, Amazon some time ago when they realized that 
they wanted to create basically a system to automatically screen CVs uh, of job applicants for technical roles. And this system was biased against women because most applicants were men. And uh, the thing is that machine learning algorithms learn from data. So if an algorithm sees more men in the data set, then somehow it thinks it's a more positive feature. And now there are many techniques that try to fight against this problem. Because it starts with the data, so in some cases it's at the root of the problem. So uh, again, maybe the Amazon engineering team was mostly male, so that's one. Uh, but there are solutions to this. That's what I want to say. Um, most of them are probably quite technical because in one way or another, uh, we can't expect, uh, you know, the reality is that most people who apply for a job in Amazon, they're male. You know, so, so we can't expect this to change now within the next year, but we have algorithmic fixes to make our algorithms learn the right way. For me, I think this comes down to a societal diversity problem the world over. I've um, been reading a fascinating book recently by um, Angela Saini called Inferior, um, talking about how, um, you know, if you take the medical field, for example, um, uh, for, for decades or even longer, uh, drugs were not tested on women because of excuses like, well, they, ha they might be pregnant and we don't know how that's going to affect the fetus or uh, numerous other examples like that, which as a result over a long period of time has cut out an entire population and society uh, uh, you know, in terms of medical research. We now know today, because of more progressive thinking, that certain drugs such as painkillers are treated very differently by, by male and female bodies because of our responses to those kind of drugs. So it's, I think for me, when it comes to biases, it's not just about the data, it's not just about um, being homogenous, but it's how do we change society to become a truly diverse place that actually sets the seed, the beginning of diversity, uh, and therefore um, a, a level playing field for this technology in the future. Right. Thank you very much. Right. It's your turn now. It's your turn. So questions. Yes, please. Lady at the front here. We've got the catch box somewhere. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the discussion is also circling a little bit around how we teach artificial intelligence ethics in a very broad sense, because this is something that we want them to do or do we want them to reflect, although sometimes we don't do it ourselves. And the point is, how can we teach them if we ourselves are not the role models for it? And one thinking was, um, maybe the way how we can teach is just the same way how we try to teach children. So give them certain sets of data or books or information that they can then digest and you know, incorporate in their bigger picture. And that may drive then their decision making and their, their way forward. So the question is? Do you think that's a feasible way to apply that also in a creative environment? <coughs> yeah, just a, a quick, uh, quick answer. I, I think uh, children are very influenced by their, their parents, and every every child uh, grows like differently. So if you if you're trying to to teach the AI like a like a child, it's probably gonna have your your own bias uh, anyway. So. Uh, I think it's really, really hard to to have something that is totally uh, fair, actually. Um, and yeah, the the AI will will always kind of reflect what we what we uh, know we we want to to give it, or what we don't know we want to give it. But it will it will have it uh, anyway. For me, I mean. Yeah, I I see this uh, much like the age old problem of the trolley dilemma of you know a trolley or a tram going down the hill and it's going down a track that splits into two, and there's one person on the left track, and there's two people on the right track, which way does the AI decide to go? Kill one person or kill two people? And for me, that's, that's a huge problem, right? And for, in a sense, most of the AI systems today that we have are like children. They're very, they're very nascent. They're still, very quite, they're still quite rudimentary, no matter how much we try to dress it up in, in media and, and other circles. So I think there's a, lot way to, a long way to go still for this maturity to set in before we can um, address that fundamental problem that you've raised. Uh, with, without necessarily giving a, a helpful answer, perchance, 
Um, there are two things I think are kind of interesting about that debate. The, the first is that I think AI has an opportunity to be a mirror of ourselves that we, we may not be able to see in our own right. So the second that you see the bias come through an AI, it's often quite jarring to go, how did, how did that happen? Right? And that forces the conversation about how do we program this thing, right? Um, and, and the second is about uh, the volume of input and the diversity of the input. So if you have a small team designing the thing and that team is very homogenous, yes, you're gonna get a, a very strong bias. But if over time you have the ability to put more inputs, different sorts of inputs and actually level the, the training of that thing, you've got a better chance. But if you go back to the first point, if society is the issue in the first place, if it's simply a mirror and you can only ever get to the place which is the state of us, then you kinda, you're gonna end up exactly where we are. And it's always gonna be, um, it's always going to uh, be after that. So it's never going to go in front of that if we're always uh, designing that. So we, the, the ethics question is, what do we want to be? What do we think is the right thing for us to become and to start to build the AI in order to, to reflect that state? Uh, that, for me, is the, the, the really interesting discussion. I, I love that analogy, by the way, because funny enough, I'm, I'm listening to you talking about children's books, and I'm thinking about when I was growing up how biased children's books were. And so... Yeah, I think we all just reflect what we've built around us. I mean, it's only now we're starting to see, you know, heroes in books being female. It's only just starting, you know. Frozen was the first Disney movie where the woman didn't get saved by a prince. I think uh, the problem with teaching children, you know, we, we've got biases that exist, as you said, in society. We'll just you, amplify those. You know what's really interesting about, about that, the, the children books thing, right? I think anyone who's got, got kids is kind of going through this, this kind of same thing. Uh, my, my partner and I, when we read to our daughter, actively change the he's to hers in books, and it takes a lot of concentration to do it, right? There are some books where it's like every second word, you're like, oh, it's a he, that's a her. And she'll correct us on it now because she's getting so used to kind of us changing the kind of, the, 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 the kind of gender. But what a problem for AI to solve, <laughs> right? Send AI out amongst children's books and get it to change the genders so that we have a more balanced view of children's books. And then send the, the documents back to the publishers to simply publish again. I love that. Can someone build that? <laughs> Sorry. I said it first. I'm going to do it. <laughs> right. Any more questions? Oh, gosh. Hands are up now. So, lady in the green jumper. Yes. Thank you all. Hi. Um, you talked a bit about sustainability and how projections of celebrities can help pass on good news messages. And then coming back to your point about how maybe AI could solve the diversity problem in children's books. Are there any other kind of big world problems that AI either is solving right now or can solve in the future? Um, yeah, lots. I mean, <laughs> and, and how? I, I, I get very excited about what's happening in medicine. You know, there's so much now happening. Like, um, you know, I'm backed by a VC that's also backed a, it's, uh, they're basically doing AI, but helping radiographers, because at the moment it takes a long time to do breast cancer screening. It requires two radiographers, but the, there will always be a human involved, but they're now being backed up by a machine, and that's meaning that they're getting from to diagnosis a lot quicker, or they're starting to get to diagnosis. So I get really excited by the use of AI in, in medicine, especially as we're in an age where we obviously have huge strains on the NHS and huge aging populations. What can we do to, to solve those problems? I get really excited about it. Yeah, I think there are a myriad of applications. Um, so the, the medical field is a great example. I'd say another great example are autonomous vehicles. If you think how many people suffer from accidents every year on the streets, uh, it's going to be huge when we don't have to be afraid of drunk drivers anymore or human error. Uh, also, anything relating to optimization. So in terms of uh, using energy and being efficient, um, this is where AI can really make a difference, uh, where we can automate many of the current processes and make them more efficient in, in many ways. Uh, but uh, right now, it's mostly those like small things which can make a huge difference. Like in the medical domain, we can create an AI doctor, but we can create a system that can scan, for example, you know, images and detect breast cancer with a similar accuracy to a doctor. So this can increase our certainty as to uh, whether the doctor is doing a good job or not, and maybe even automate some of those small processes. And we're going to see, we're going to be seeing more and more of this as years go by. So. 
Uh, yeah, if you if you go back on the energy sector, uh, you have like a lot of uh, uh, new energy sources, uh, such as like uh, uh, solar panels or stuff like that. Uh, the batteries are not uh, that good at the moment, so this could be uh, like artificial intelligence will uh, probably help uh, to manage like the the supply and the demand uh, of the with these new uh, energy sources. So that's another. Another thing you can help to address new problems. Yeah, and I, I was going to say medicine, but you stole that from me first. Right. But yeah, that's okay. Um, but you know, I'm a user of Babylon. I love it. You know, most of the time I just uh, ask the chat bot rather than uh, having a video consultation with a doctor. It works great for me. It answers the question most of the time. Or uh, if you look at what our, uh, DeepMind are doing with uh, maculative, uh, macular degenerative diseases of, of the eye, uh, being able to sift through millions and millions of images and picking out uh, patterns uh, of uh, eye problems uh, well in advance and faster uh, than most highly trained doctors, allowing them to then have more uh, patient uh, doctor relationship quality time rather than just doing the sort of the menial work. The, the other area, I think, for me is education. Uh, I think it, uh, AI is having a huge effect already in the area of education. When you look at a lot of the online platforms that are out today, uh, they've either started to implement already or they're uh, heavily investing in the use of machine learning in uh, helping pr uh, people progress through educational paths and also diversify the educational paths that they choose to go down uh, through predictive recommendations um, uh, and being able to tweak in real time, your learning curriculum to adjust to your performance and your ability to progress or inability to progress. So it's not a one size fits all solution uh, for everybody. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> well, now we're rolling. Now we're rolling. So, young gentleman over there with a the blue wristband. Blue, blue. There we go. Um, so uh, a bit, bit more of a niche one on, on the artwork side. So um, obviously, because you don't know why the AI's built what it's built, apart from the fact that you've put the input in, um, a lot of when you go to a gallery is you're actually looking at the story of an artist's life and um, there's a lot more behind it. And a lot of the value in the artwork is, you know, if you're stood in a room um, and you're looking around at artworks that an artist has created over a 50, 60 year period, it changes based on their life events, and that's fascinating to see. Do you think that AI artwork can expand beyond just aesthetics? Yeah, I'd say so. Actually, it's not that different from uh, normal artworks. It's just uh, a different tool to create, and it only uh, uh, it only does the image creation part. But all the content behind, all the the intention uh, is still held by the the artist. So when we choose a subject, when we choose the data that we want to given the algorithm, when we build the algorithm, uh, then when we choose the, the medium that we want to, 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 to make it in, like, uh, for example, uh, we've been doing like uh, classical portraits, but we, we're probably gonna do um, a Japanese uh, kind of, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, estamp, but yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically a, a huge part is still, uh, is still done by the artist, and I think that's where the, the content comes from. And also, it could be like a, a a way for the artist to focus more on the content and less on the on the on the image. But uh, I don't know if it's good or bad. But that's that's a way to do it. Oh, well, let's give you a catch box. Yep. Nobody can hear you. Yeah, um, on this topic, I was thinking it's also about the media that you use in art. There is certain media that uh, change through time, and there is media that is digital print or digital projections that is immediate. And in that topic, I wanted to ask you a question about, there was this project in 1970 from a researcher in California. He was a professor, I think, called Aaron Cohen, and he built this project called uh, Arnold Al Arnold, which was a robot that was painting, and it was basically paint using a code, which probably one of the digital code that you now we use. And I think, uh, what did you use that as a reference or was that something that you uh, were inspired from or? Uh, it's, yeah, uh, I haven't heard about it actually, so ah, right. <laughs> I, I didn't get uh, inspired by it. Um, but uh, I think it's more in the field of, uh, of robotic pro probably. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. more like uh, the, the final uh, application. 
uh, what we get in the end is a JPEG uh, JPEG file. So mm -hmm. and then we we choose the way to 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 make it uh, an artwork. So it's kind of a, another discipline, I'd say. Yeah, it's but, a mix. Yeah. But yeah. it's really really close to it. Yeah. yeah. Question. So, so I think both your questions are su they're super philosophical questions, actually. Um, w one of my thoughts is, um, if, if you're thinking about an algorithm, an AI, truly trying to independently create an artwork 100% rather than having human assistance in it, I think it, a lot of it boils down to the fact that we, we are humans with senses, smell, touch, sight, hearing that to a large degree machines can't emulate like we do. When I'm hungry, my stomach rumbles and makes a sound. A machine can't do that. I feel in a certain way when I smell something, it, it evokes a memory from 20 years ago, which I don't know whether a machine could do that yet. It might be able to emulate it. When you look at, uh, when you look at companies like Beyond Verbal, who are now starting to uh, emulate human emotion, there's, if you YouTube Beyond Verbal, Steve Jobs interview, I swear you'll all just your chins will just hit the ground when you watch that video. It's a form of very, very sophisticated emulation of human emotion interpretation. But I think I'll come back to the fact that machines, a lump of silicon, us, flesh and blood with senses and emotions are very different. To be able to emulate that uh, in any level of realism and call it truly creative or creativity is something I think is a big question mark. Uh, uh, that's in my mind, at least. Thank you. Did that answer your questions? Fabulous. Any more? Okay. Right, let's go right at the back. Oh, no, you chose. You nominated. <laughs> you nominated. Let's, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Go on. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, okay, I'm with Amazon, so I get these, uh, these jokes quite often. Um, <laughs> as a question, we've currently discussed the avenues where AI is likely to go. Uh, being experts at this field or uh, being on the panel, which are the avenues where you suggest AI should not go um, for the betterment of mankind? Um, we know there is wicked intelligence. Can there ever be wicked artificial intelligence as well? I'll walk right into this one. Um, I mean, look, th the fundamental is for every use of technology, there's a misuse. Right? And it doesn't take very much to go back to kind of the dawn of time before you kind of figure out that that's, that's the thing that happens to us. We're, we're not very nice. Uh, type of being. Um, I mean, there's plenty of places where I, where I definitely don't want it to go, but it's already going to go there. Um, I, I think the, the bigger question is kind of how do we manage its, its progress in, into those types of places? Um, and it is, it is going to be one of the um, ethical and moral dilemmas of, of our time because at the moment, as, as we're kind of all kind of agreeing to, it is at the service of um, what we're capable of programming it to do. Um, the second that uh, and to be perfect, I mean, let's be really clear, we don't really understand our, our own brains yet. Like not, in fact, not even close, right? It, there's an enormous part of who we are, how we think, how we come to conclusions that we simply do not understand, right? Um, the idea of sort of neurosciences is, uh, my partner's an academic in, in Cambridge, uh, and the, the latest uh, uh, title de jour is neuroscientist in whatever, happen, whatever field it happens to be. If, if, as long as you put neuroscience in front of it, you can get hired anywhere right now. Um, but for the, for the large part of things, it's just still scanning a very rough part of the brain using a computer and you don't actually learn very much. It's an incredibly blunt science. So until we know a lot more about actually how our own brains function, applying that to a piece of artificial intelligence is really only going to go so far as to teach it the, the functions that we understand. Now, there's plenty, we were talking before about plenty of examples of, of artificial intelligence going to places that we don't understand ourselves. Um, you know, the neural networks not being able to explain themselves. Uh, the uh, I think it was, was it Facebook that kind of the AI technology started talking to each other in a language that the human programmers didn't understand, and everyone freaked the fuck out, right? Yeah, it, that sort of stuff is, is kind of coming, but it's still based on a fundamental kind of uh, programming that hasn't surpassed our understanding of ourselves. I think part of the attraction for me, just to kind of drive back to some of the creative things, is actually. Um, Part of the fact that we don't understand how it does these things is the part that makes it quite magical, right? Because it's kind of beyond the capacity of what we know in ourselves we can do creatively. And it may not be, you know, some people might find that sort of fake and sort of, sort of shallow, but um, 
there is still something kind of very interesting and ultimately very new and original in that you kind of you put a computer to a task and it goes somewhere where you may not have been able to go yourself. That's that's kind of interesting. Um, but as far as going to the, like where is it going that we don't want it to go, I think we can all be fairly clear. We like it to kind of not be used in warfare very much. Um, but I think that it's our responsibility as a generation to try and do everything we can to focus on the places where it can be positive and, and, and kind of constructive. I think the scary thing is it's already gone to places <laughs> that it shouldn't have gone. I mean, you just have to look at what's happening in the world right now and the algorithms we've created and the things that we've perpetuated with those algorithms. I think we've already gone there. I think our responsibility now is to realize we've gone there and to start putting in place sensible solutions to where we've taken ourselves. Um, I mean, I was watching... I was well, listening to the news recently and they were interviewing a guy, a huge Trump supporter. And uh, he was like, I know I'm right because everyone on Facebook agrees with me. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I mean, we're already going there, but I think it's we know that. And so we have to I am an optimist, so we have to try and look at ways to make solutions around that. Yeah, I think that's a super serious question. And for me, I think it. Uh, it uh, it's there isn't a simple answer right now, but a start to that is to try and come to a consensus around global ethics frameworks. Uh, I think companies like Amazon, Google, Apple, and others are starting to come up with their own ethical frameworks on how to use or not use AI. Um, it's a bit similar to how the world came together to solve the problem of the hole in the ozone layer or um, some of the ethical uh, rules around um, genetic engineering. Uh, that are being challenged in uh, recently that we saw in China and in other places uh, where we need to be really strong uh, as, a, as a set of global uh, people and leaders and countries to come together in consensus around those ethical frameworks. Great, thank you. Any other questions? If we go to the back, this is going to test your throwing and catching skills now. If we take the, uh, the man next to the tree. All right. If you can, I, 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 you're really going for it now. Duck, everyone. <laughs> no, you're cheating. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is also coming from Amazon to Microsoft. So. Oh, there you Thank go. You. <laughs> um, so my question is going back to the beginning and to the value question, right? So and my question is this. Imagine you have a work of art created by an artificial intelligence or uh, seeded by a human and then uh, created by an AI and someone created fully by a digital artist, okay? How would you value both? And on the other side, imagine you have a book created by a human author or a book created by an artificial intelligence. In both cases, they could be seeded, so partially automated or not. How would you value both cases? Who would like to pick that one up? I think you just value it on how good it is in the end, right? Sorry, sorry? I think you just value it on how good it is in the end, like the end product. Is it good or is it bad? So and can not I just on the add, process. Can you know? I just add something to the question? Yeah. Um, in, the human case, in the human case, the person creates at best one a day. In the other case, he can create 10,000 a day. Yeah, so more good books for us, right? <laughs> not bad. No, so I, I know what you mean. Like it, yeah. It's uh, if you kind of industrialize industrialize the whole thing, uh, it loses uh, like it's uh, it's it's value actually. Yeah. Um, so probably um, the thing is, for example, with this, you don't get to meet uh, the the author uh, of the of the AI, AI book, and he can't tell you his story and why he wrote that, and maybe that's that adds some value to the. To the to the artwork. So if if he makes one um, uh, one book with AI uh, and works a lot on it, uh, on the content, on the process, uh, you can you can say it's a it's a good book because it has a lot of content. Uh, if he if he makes like uh, ten thousand, he doesn't even know what's uh, written in it. Uh, maybe you lose some part of the of the the interesting uh, part of the book. There's a part of this. Uh, this is not a, a completely useful answer to this, but. I'm always fascinated by, by this sort of question because if you look at music as an example, like if you go back to kind of how music was originally created uh, and what it took to even then make recorded music, right? it was an enormous amount of effort. It was very slow. There's a lot of craft involved. Um, and now anybody in this room can make 
any sort of music on their laptop before they leave the room tonight. Um, now, it's not a like for like in terms of there's a, there's a story that sits behind it that's artificial or a kind of human thing, but, but it does kind of change the way that you look at the value of the stuff that gets produced, right? And it, it's, it's a, it is a really interesting kind of thought because we don't value digital music less necessarily. Um, it allowed us to go to sonic places that we've never been before, right? Um, when the synthesizer was first co-embedded, people kind of reacted very, very negatively to it. It's like, well, what is this stupid sound, right? And now it's the dominant sound of all of our modern music. So uh, I kind of, I'd be fascinated um, in a you know, decade or so, or perhaps longer, perhaps, um, to see how we look at the combination of those things together. Um, and actually, there may just simply be a bunch of people who have a um, particular taste for artificial intelligence created, created works and people who choose not to find that stuff interesting. I'm not sure it's going to be an either or. I suspect it's going to be, as you said, like more good books for everybody. Your, you, your, hope, question, anyway. your question reminds me of uh, Max Tegmark's recent book around uh, artificial superintelligence and the sci-fi scenario at the beginning of his book where he describes an AI that can uh, produce uh, journalistic output and creative writing so convincingly that he completely dupes the world into uh, not noticing this super intelligence that slowly beavers away in the background and eventually establishes world dominance through its media empire. And I, I, I don't know, yeah, right, maybe right, we are heading right. towards that direction if we're not careful. <laughs> okay, did that answer your question? <laughs> So so okay. Actually, I'll add one little thing. Progress. That. Sorry, yeah. I will add one thing. I think um, I think as we move more into a, an age of automation, and you know, my community is primarily millennial. Actually, a lot of them are under twenty-five. I think there is that increasing value put on the more human connections or the the more analog connections in the world. So I think that that you know there is experiences that you can't get from as you said, you can't meet the author or you can't meet the, the painter or you don't, you know, you haven't got this immersive experience you can go into. And there's so much more, um, I guess, value being put on those experiences now these days, partly because we are so digitized. So I think that's an interesting way to look at it as well. No, that's fine. <laughs> Any other builds? No? Next question. Who wants to go next? All right. Oh, nomination. Go on, you choose. You choose. <laughs> so based on the same theme about sort of the personality of the artist um, if we think about it from a counterfactual perspective if all art was produced by AI and we think about it from the perspective of a child now we all have an artist that we admire be it artist, be it a musician be it artist, be it maybe something else entirely like a media presenter if all art was produced by AI, is there a role model for children to look up, look up to, and is there a role for us to follow? Take that one. God. Mm. <laughs> You've got everyone thinking now. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, and and, and I, I love your point about role modeling, because it is so intrinsically important. I mean, um, they actually, just as a side note, they did a recent, um, PwC did some brilliant research on why there aren't more women in doing computer science and in tech, and it's um, something like only 23% of school kids can name a woman in tech, and you're looking at the crossover. But if you look back to the 50s, obviously, the diversity and gender in, in computer science was amazing. Something happened along the way. So role modeling is so important. But yes, if machines did everything, no, there'd be no fucking role models. I, but that might be the most flip answer to that question ever. Um. <laughs> I, it, that's a, it's a wicked question. Because, uh, you know, like I, I remember, you know, my role model was when I was seven, um, an uncle came over to start his master's at a university in the UK, spent a week at, at my home. And it just so happened that my dad at the time bought me my first computer, a BBC Micro Model B. And this uh, uncle opened it up. I'd never touched a computer before. He'd never heard of the BBC Micro before, although he was a computer science graduate um, from abroad. And he flicked through the uh, manual and programmed Space Invaders over the space of five days. And at the age of seven, that was my role model. And that's how I ended up in my career in IT. And so I wonder whether in the future or even today, whether children would take, I don't know, would AlphaGo 
be a role model for somebody to become a go, uh, you know, aficionado or an expert, or the equivalent, you know, deep blue, uh, you know, beating the first person at chess and all of that. I, I don't know, maybe, but I'm not sure it's quite there yet. So that was a very good point because I was about to say something similar. As in, I don't think that uh, AI would be a role model for a child, uh, but many of us who were very enthusiastic about science and technology since a young age, um, we were not always having scientists as role models, but it was their discoveries or you know the mysteries of the universe. Um, th this is where you know, we would see beauty, we would obsess over these details, and this kind of love affair uh, continues later on when you do further studies when you do your PhD, when you become a researcher. So maybe we're going to see more kids being excited about algorithms, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially when these algorithms start overtaking more and more aspects of our lives, and we expect people to be more informed, not afraid of the algorithms, so that they can find and get some of the issues we mentioned, such as bias, for example. Amazing points that I'm going to try not to duplicate. Uh, I I kind of have a I find the question a uh, intellectually difficult one to kind of respond to because I don't know if you're ever going to be able to stop people from being creative um, and generating some form of expression of themselves. So the 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 state that you're describing suggests that everybody's basically batteries, which I, I'm just not sure is possible. Right? Um, it, it some will be in a much worse state and there'll be worse. Uh, harder questions to be asking if we're in that state, then will children have role models? Um, so uh, I think to, to a lot of the points kind of been discussed already that, that um, the art that's being created by artificial intelligence, it might be the artificial intelligence itself that becomes the thing that inspires people. Um, but I, I'm not sure that I, I could possibly imagine a world where as human beings we are uh, not producing some sort of expression. Okay, I think we'll take a couple more. And then we'll start to uh, slow things down a little bit. So the black box is there. Would you like to nominate um, the next person? Sorry? <laughs> ah, very good. Where's it going to go next? Hey, um, so I work for a deafblind charity. And I think that... AI is sort of becoming more creative, but my question is more around how long do you think it's going to take for AI to actually be accessible? So, you know, we, I work at using alternative text um, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter on all these platforms, but it's not potentially something that everyone really considers. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where I'm aiming at. I have the microphone I'm starting, cost off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a really great question, uh, and it's it's actually something that we've we've talked uh, quite a bit about, um, not just professionally, but kind of uh, in sort of personal circles, because um, like any technology or any sort of resource, the access to that resource is a is a thing that drives people apart from the haves and have nots. And right now, artificial intelligence is still something that is accessible by a few and not by an enormous amount of people. However, to my point earlier about problems that AI can solve. Um, some of the, the barriers to, to access to that technology might just be solved by that technology. Um, at, you know, I've got some technical experts over here who I hope will kind of <laughs> um, see, see if that goes much further, but um, it's an excellent, excellent kind of th thing to be considering is how do you make sure that a technology that has incredible power for change is something that's accessible to more people than the, the privileged view of the world that we kind of currently see. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, to add to this point, I mentioned earlier about meta-learning and automated machine learning. So these are all really efforts to democratize machine learning. So we've seen a democratization of uh, data science recently, as in, let's say 10 years ago, you'd really need to understand the details behind the algorithms and know how to code this thing yourself. Now we see software developers being able to do the same thing. And it won't be long before we see people who are not developers, nor data scientists, being able to use some of those technologies. I don't know how far we can go, uh, but I think we can go pretty far in terms of democratizing these tools. Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, I 100% I agree. I, I mean, it will happen, I hopefully, faster than we think. I think a really fascinating thing I realized recently was um, one of the biggest VCs here in London, they have the biggest fund. Um, when they're hiring engineers now, the cre key, key criteria they look for in engineers is creativity. And I think it's sort of in the foresight that you can't, you, a lot of things will become a lot more accessible. It's the creative engineers they need as opposed to, you know, literally coding by rule. So I think it is moving faster, maybe not fast enough, but it is getting there. Um, I, I think the combination of creative creativity and assistive technologies is a huge field. Um, and I think there's a really excellent example from Microsoft, actually, um, that I came across uh, about a year and a half ago called, uh, it's a project called Emma. And uh, it was a piece of technology that helped a lady called Emma who was developing early stage Parkinson's disease and had the shakes at a very young age. I think in her late 20s, early 30s, she was an artist and a writer and she lost the ability to control her pen or pencil completely. And using assistive technology, it was a wristband that uh, measured the vibration of, of her fingers and her hands. And it sort of gave a force feedback to counter that vibration. and through many iterations of this technology, um, she was amazingly able to control a pen well enough to draw and write again, and had such a massive impact on somebody who was still so young. Um, so I think you know the capacity for cr the, the of create creatively applying uh, uh, artificial intelligence to assistive technology, whether it's uh, deaf, blind, or other forms of disabilities, is is a absolutely fascinating and a huge area of research today. Uh, yeah, coming back on the on how long it's going to take, uh, I don't really know, but uh, probably it's going to be uh, one factor would be uh, uh, how the the technology to run the the, the computations uh, evolves. So if it becomes really cheap to to make a lot of uh, com uh, of uh, calculations, probably it will become more accessible and cheaper to do. Uh, and also, I think there's like a, a huge uh, uh, opportunity for for uh, new businesses to to kind of uh, uh, give that technology to everyone. So probably a lot of businesses will jump on this opportunity and and make it uh, available. So I, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think it's going to happen. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Right, we'll take one more question. So this one more question, we'll have to make it count. It need to be a really good question. No pressure, anybody. Right. I'm going to put it to the panel to choose who they like to go next. <laughs> yeah, let's let's do that. Where's the catch box? It could be thrown or passed along. However, we want to do that safely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just to expand on what Mr. Williams has touched upon before, I have heard from some. AI developers that no matter how random the decision from AI appears to be to us, there is some underlying algorithm beneath that. Uh, but similarly to that, I think that humans have genetic coding as well, which was shown through the re research to influence our mood and our decisions as well. Do you think that those kinds of codes should be di differentiated? And whether you think that maybe we're a bit biased towards ourselves in overlooking that there might be some kind of pattern to our own decisions too. Mr. Williams, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually just my dad. Um, it, I, I've always, uh, so I, I've worked a little bit with, with, with Amazon and, and one of the things that I've always found really fascinating is, is why we haven't given Alexa mood swings, like the ability to be upset with you or to feel really positive and have you have to respond to that tech rather than it being kind of balanced. Um, I, I kind of like this this idea that you build a sort of frailty or, or kind of um, randomness to the kind of way that that technology's default setting actually actually kind of lands. Uh, no idea whether we should do it, but <laughs> but, but but it'd be kind of interesting, right? Because it, it's part of the it's part of our DNA to kind of um, respond in, in context and to pick up those signals very very quickly. Um, it might send us to the creepy valley um, very very quickly. And actually, I think part of the com the comfort in the the current state of artificial technology, especially in the, the digital assistant space, um, is the constant that you kind of get. I know it's I know it's not human. It, it has a kind of a distance there that becomes a part of the dynamic of, of the household rather than being a member of the family. Um, but I, I 
I think there's a, there's a really interesting kind of uh, feel just around the inputs that you give this, this technology so that it has that sort of flexibility to become more than what it was in the original programming. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think that's a great question. Um, the thing is that right now most of the problems that AI is solving are quite narrow in scope and it's only in few of those challenges such as chatbots where personality, you know, the algorithm displaying some sort of personality uh, has been an issue. Uh, it's what you described earlier that, you know, sometimes actually most of the times algorithm can seem far off from us. Uh, so what we have to remember is that we have evolved around, you know, millions of years if you take our full genetic line to be able to adapt to a very complex changing environment, uh, both the physical environment, the social environment. Uh, we also have bodies and the algorithms, they don't have any of these things. You know, they're just <laughs> things which sit somewhere in a cloud. Uh, they don't respond to a complex environment. They respond to complex but very narrow problems. Uh, however, uh, there's this uh, grand vision of creating general artificial intelligence, and these are some of the arguments that have been discussed. For example, uh, one of the arguments was that you can't have a general artificial intelligence without a body, without some sort of personality, and uh, these are things that are still being uh, investigated. Uh, so the, to answer your question, I'm not sure. I think that some of those mechanisms that we have in us can be mechanisms which were uh, adaptive in some other circumstances now are causing issues. Uh, maybe they're adaptive still in some circumstances, but they can be problematic in, in other cases. Uh, it remains to be seen actually how much of this we can put into a machine to make it, you know, whatever we want to make it really, because <laughs> we discussed about, uh, you know, AI being evil, AI being more human. In reality, we, we don't have real AI yet. Yeah, so, so it just remains to be seen. <laughs> I don't know either, but I think it might be just more on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I get quite interested by the work that's being done in terms of robotics for carers. I, has anyone in here had an ill family member or parent or whatever I have? Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen the kind of toilet took on my stepfather caring for my mother, for example. And there's brilliant parts of caring where you want to be there in the personality and there's really awful parts like changing things. And, and so I love the idea of a robot that could have supported my stepdad so that he, my mum could have stayed at home. Um, and, but then I hate the idea if it didn't have some sort of personality or emotion because the whole, whole idea of this horrible thing just interacting with my mother would have been awful. So I think, in, I think it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's going to be what are we wanting the machine to do? And if it is caring for someone and taking off the burden of some of the horrible things around caring, then yes, we should have the personality that makes, enriches the lives of the people we're trying to serve with that machine, I think. Yeah, I, I think um, it's kind of like a, as an anti-theory, anti so to speak. I think the reason why people, at least in my opinion, people aren't embracing machine learning or AI-based solutions in mass yet and they're just still being sold these solutions by big corporations is because actually they lack that human emotion uh, they are still very artificial by its very definition and so i think when these technologies do start to display or emulate in to a more sophisticated level human emotion personality and all of those nuances people will start to become more at ease with these technologies and therefore they will start to become much more commonplace um, and permeate through our everyday lives in a much more meaningful way. Yeah, I think that's yeah probably true for young generations. Maybe uh, older generations will be a bit more reluctant to to adopting the like uh, a human like uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but yeah, you you said like uh, a lot. So all I can add is that uh, exploring like uh, uh, how uh, an artificial intelligence can can have like this these uh, soft intentions uh, will be like really interesting, and it will force us to look like inside us and what's uh, actually making us do that. So it's probably going to be like a an interesting journey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I think when it comes to questions, that, that rounds us down nicely. And I know we've all been sat here for a very long time and a very, very interesting conversation. And I think it's opened up probably more questions. But I think that's a good thing because it allows us to keep thinking about it, keep talking about it, keep, keep researching, keep looking at it and just see where we get to. And fundamentally, yes, we are creative and anything could be created in that way. I just want to give a big, big thank you to our panel. It's been absolutely amazing. <laughs> and that rounds us down. So by all means, you'd like to hang around and ask the panel some questions afterwards. You can. Um, if you need to disappear quickly, you can do that also. But then thank you so much for coming this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we'll let you know exactly when our next event will be. So thank you. I hope you had a good night. Thank you.